Now, this is the first time I have uh, ever had the, uh, the pleasure and the opportunity to speak to someone who teaches at Harvard. Harvard, of course, is one of the world's leading universities. And uh, anyone who has Harvard attached to the name has a certain moniker, a certain uh, status. Is that true? Gosh, I don't know. You're putting the pressure on me, aren't you, Jim? <laughs> but no, really, Harvard, Harvard is really quite the place. I, mean. I, think, I think one thing that's nice about Harvard, it's a voice that you can trust. And uh, yeah. things are done at, a, at an important pace as far as being uh, very deliberate and thoughtful about processes that are going on. So I think that that's probably what does mark that. And it's definitely part of my own training is to be thoughtful and deliberate about what, uh, what I do as far as research or writing and also helping people. Now, if you're thoughtful and deliberate and, and you're teaching at Harvard, you're also a Red Sox fan, right? Absolutely. I was at Fenway just, uh, just this week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, I don't know. Well, I guess the Yankees uh, have a pretty strong fan base. But boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's, like, it's like religion in Boston. You're exactly right. It is like religion. Yeah, I, I just don't know how anybody can live in Boston and not cheer for the Sox. But moving right along, The Winner's Brain. Uh, here's the book. Uh, you have a co-author who is a Canadian. Mark Fenske uh, teaches at uh, Guelph University, right? That's right, University of Guelph. University of Guelph, which is just uh, literally about 40 minutes from where we're sitting right That's now. Right. Um, why the book? Well, you know, the book came out through Harvard Health Publications, and I was asked to co-author the book, and because of my background in cognitive behavioral psychology, Mark's research as a cognitive neuroscientist, um, we wanted to be able to look at the research that's come out recently on what a living, healthy brain is capable of doing. There are a lot of books out there that are, are nicely written, that have anecdotes about what people have done, but Harvard wanted to have a book that had a backbone of science, uh, but the exciting piece for us was that we also found a lot of people who met with success on a regular basis that really confirmed what science and the lab were saying. Now, when you say Harvard wanted it, uh, this is not really a technical book. It's, it's, no. it's, more of a, it's more of a popular book in the sense that it's written for people like me who have not had any uh, studies in this area. Uh, is this a book that uh, you know, you'll be putting on the reader's list for students? It could, it could be, certainly could be, and I've heard from professors who have been doing that already. Uh, the book itself is written for uh, the lay reader yeah. uh, about how the brain can be optimized. It's a, it's a very interesting thing that's happened with research recently, um, basically because of technologies allowing us to look inside and see the brain. Researchers are doing a fabulous job, you know, nationally, internationally, looking at what the brain is capable of doing. So that's where we started our search, was looking at all of the research that's been done that uh, lets us know what the brain can do as far as when it's maximized. Now, when I was growing up, I was told that the brain was relatively inflexible. You know, the brain is set, and if you have brain damage or even just the process of aging, uh, you're losing brain cells every day, yada, 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 and there's no way the brain can really recover from trauma or uh, just the ravages of time. That's now, right. uh, that's what I was told. Right. I'm reading your book. By the way, it's excellent read, well written. Uh, thanks to you and Mark and also Liz Neperant, Neperant who, right. who helped you write it. I, I get to page 159, and, and this just kind of jumped out at me. You talked about plasticity. Uh, you call it um, neuroplasticity of the brain. And this sentence, it is quite literally the secret, plasticity, to molding a winner's brain and the backbone of brainstorm tips in this book. The core quality of the brain is its flexibility. That's exactly right. Some really nice research that came out of uh, London, the University College of London, uh, focusing on London cab drivers, the traditional black cab drivers. It really highlights this the best, and that was that they looked at cab drivers who have to study for two or three years before they can take the exam to get what they call the knowledge. Now, we actually sat down in London with these cab drivers and spoke with them. They worked very hard learning all of these routes, and uh, then the research looked at their brains versus the brains of others uh, that were doing all that hard work and they found out that the cab driver's hippocampus, a part of the brain that is used for visual and spatial navigation, was actually a little bit larger there. And that's a great, probably a, probably a classic example of neuroplasticity. So it's, it's that hard work. We can't just kind of sit around and think about our brains. We've talked to too many people over time um, and we've decided that a lot of brains are just on idle. Uh, no pun intended with the cab driver example, but it's true. The brains are on idle. People aren't doing anything to actually engage their brains. 
Um, so we sat down with these guys over in uh, London, and there are women cab drivers in London as well that have worked very hard to uh, learn the, the maps, the routes. They have to be responsible for 400 different routes from point A to point B. Uh, one of the cab drivers actually said, we've heard, and I can't do his accent worth yeah. justice at all, he said, we've heard about this research on our hippocampus. He said, I can get you to the Brazilian embassy in a cinch, but I have no idea where my hippocampus is. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, you know, it really is remarkable, and we found in interviewing so many people who have met with success on a regular basis that, that they do work very hard. Hard work is part of success and optimization what your brain's capable of. Kathy and I uh, gave an address to a London cabbie one time at about 11.30 at night, and the guy got lost. Uh-oh. Yeah, so either he was a newbie, or else we just happened to get him on a bad night. But I, I love the story you told of the, uh, uh, the race between the uh, black cabbie uh, driver and the um, GPS owner. That's right. And, and, and the, the, the cabbie guy won. 45 minutes, something like that? So. Yeah, yes, yes. yeah, amazing, amazing story. Because he knew all the back routes. That's the right. GPS didn't know the back routes. He knew the, he knew the traffic flow. The GPS didn't know the traffic flow. So he was able to be proactive, whereas the GPS is reactive. That was my analysis, anyway. Magnetic resonance imaging has taken, now I'm assuming this, brain studies out of the realm of uh, the speculative into the realm of the pragmatic and the real. Is that right? That's right. That's like you're right. actually able to look at a brain and various parts of the brain light up when various stimuli are there or not there, right? That's exactly right. My co-author Mark, that's what he does for a living. He talks with people and then hooks them up to a scanner and sees things flowing through their brains. And it's an amazing process. Uh, and you're right, the technology is incredible. It's revealing things to us about our brains. And who knows what we'll be knowing even in the, in the last or the next few years. It's happening so fast. Now, you know, I, um, I'm not going to get into the, 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 these great hooks that you, uh, that you provide in the book. You, you know, the, uh, our viewers have to buy it for themselves. You talk about... Uh, well, the, the various elements of, um, of, of the brain, uh, at times I found it overwhelming. Well, even though you, you kind of lay out the map at the beginning, I, I, I kept forgetting what is a hippocampus. In fact, mm -hmm. I didn't know until now how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Hippocampus. <laughs> anyway, right. anyway, but let, let's just talk in general terms. Um, you, you talk about persistence. Uh, people face challenges, and it's uh, the challenge is overwhelming, and they try and try and try, and eventually give up because they say, "I just can't get my mind around this. I just, just, just can't do it." But you say that persistence can actually train the brain to do what you thought was impossible. Right. Let's expand on right. that. Well, I think one of the first things that someone has to be aware of is the self-awareness. What are they bringing to the table when they're trying to either solve a problem or meet with success? Um, that is an important piece of persistence and resilience, in fact. Uh, the resilient brain looks different than a non-resilient brain. Really? Mm -hmm. Research is showing that. And we think that it's important um, from a cognitive behavioral psychology perspective, and again, not to sound too jargony and, and sciencey, simply said cognitive behavioral has to do with how we think and what we do with our actions and we can be very deliberate uh, with how we think we can change how we think if i said to you you know don't think about a pink elephant now guess what happens i think about a pink elephant and probably a million people just thought of a pink elephant yeah. so there is this ability that we have to affect how we think and until people understand that um, they may not have the best grasp on persistence and resilience and motivation and those sorts of things. That self-awareness is important. There's a nice piece of research um, that we mention in the book that features what's called, uh, unfortunately, the double whammy of incompetence. And the, the research asks individuals to do a particular task and then to evaluate how well they did that task. Uh, they didn't do the task so well, and they didn't know that they didn't they do didn't so well. They didn't know that they didn't do so well, right? So persistence, sometimes uh, we, have to, we have to first understand where it is we're coming from. What are we doing? Um, are we trying to do something that may be impossible? People who are successful on a consistent basis have what we believe is called a talent meter. They are able to recognize what their skills and abilities are. They get those evaluated through reading or getting a mentor. If they're no good or they're, they need to remediate those, then they go out and do that, and they're not afraid to do that. We spoke with B.B. King, uh, and B.B. King told us at the end of his interview, one thing that he needed to do more of was practice. I couldn't believe it. I actually <laughs> laughed when he said that. But really, it, it speaks to the volume of 
of intentionality, that deliberateness that we have to put forth using our brains to make sure that we're doing a good job of reaching toward what we're capable of doing. And this is a, this is a process. It's something that requires effort. It's not something that our culture tells us. Our culture tells us, yeah, you know, you can be whatever you want to. All you have to do is buy our, our item, our, buy our brand, et cetera. But it is really hard work. And it's not necessarily uh, people who are <laughs> struggling with jazz or blues right now. They, well, I'll never be B.B. King. That's fine. Success really is defined on an individual basis, whether that has to do with our faith, if that has to do um, with uh, being a parent, whatever success is for us and optimizing our brains in that context is really what's important.